Tell three people, Jesus loves you. Tell three other people, cheer up, Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Cheer up, Jesus loves you. He cares about you. service ah, I feel sorry for you one more time <laughs> oh boy we had a time all right are you ready for this you know last Sunday I I began to teach on the Lordship of Jesus and we couldn't even we couldn't even get through the introduction so we couldn't really enter into the subject the lordship of Jesus oh father we give you praise we give you glory we adore you righteous one thank you for giving us life thank you for sending Jesus to die for us Thank you for raising him from the dead for our justification. Thank you for sending us the Holy Ghost to teach and to guide us, to instruct us, to lead us, to fill us with power. We give you praise. Our hearts and our minds are open one more time to hear and receive the word of God, to live by it, to be refreshed, strengthened, informed, and guided by your light we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen, amen. praise God I love Jesus do you yes. oh boy you know I, I like it when you go to church and hear the Word of God you know there are people who go to church and they don't listen to the word of God they sit at the back take Sunday newspaper and then they start reading rubbish the Bible says give me your heart God speaking through the word he says give me your heart let your eyes observe my ways but most people give their hearts to newspapers and junk magazines and those magazines are not good for nothing but to be thrown into the junkyard and many give their hearts to those things give their minds to those things and expect to come out successfully in life no it's not going to work 
if you were successful and then you gave your heart to such materials, you will not stay successful for long enough or much longer. You're taking a nose dive. You see, you can't set your heart on those things. I told you, you have to decide what kind of life you're going to live. The one always reading the news or the one making the news. You're on either side of the fence. And there are those who are always writing about somebody and they're not worth writing about. What life do you want? Somebody says, my pen is very powerful. I can write anything about anybody. Stupid. <laughs> See, how come nobody's writing about you? Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, if you do something right, they'll talk about you. If you do something wrong, they'll talk about you. If you don't do nothing, then no, nobody's going to talk about you anyway. <laughs> so don't worry about being talked about. Just go and do what God called you to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're talking about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I began explaining to you that um, the proclamation of his Lordship was what brought us into salvation. You remember? And we feasted on Romans chapter 10, verse 9. For it said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, while we're on this subject, let me explain something to you. Doesn't matter what kind of life you're living, if it's not founded on the word of God, you have but a short time of joy, a short time of happiness. You're not going to go very long. You will not go far. Make no mistakes about it. Let no one deceive you. Every other foundation is false. The Bible says no other foundation can be laid except the foundation of Christ. Hallelujah. The men whose life is founded on the word of God will win at the end. See, I'm looking at life and I'm looking at the end. I'm looking at the end. The man, the woman, whose life is founded on the word of God will win at the end. Have you watched those folks running? They have a. They have these um, sometimes four hundred meter race or eight hundred. Many you go around twice. Some have one thousand five hundred, and so on. You do not take off the way those who are going for 100 meters take off. How many of you know that? If you're a sprinter here, you already know what I'm talking about. Imagine if you have 5,000 meters to go and then you, you took off like the guy who's going 100 meters. It won't be long before you start panting and asking for glucose. But well, that's the way some people are. They took off wrongly. They never had the time to settle on the word of God, to understand the word of God, so they could live a true and solid life. Now you're here. Some of you are into politics. Some of you are in a government service. Some of you are businessmen and women some are students 
in different fields, professionals of different kinds. You're all from varying fields of life. Wonderful. But where is your life founded? Is it founded on your job? You would lose. It will fail. Is it founded on your business? It will fail. On what is it founded? And Athens was asked the question. You don't believe in God. He said, I don't. What if you die and then you find out there's a God what are you going to do he thought for a moment he said I don't think there's a God what if you found out there's a God he said I don't think there's any what if you found out I don't think there's any do you know everything no what if this happens to be one of those things you don't know? Well, he said, that would be very serious then. <laughs> See, the ages has nothing to plug his life to. Nothing. Now, that doesn't mean that if you believe in something, it's okay. What I'm trying to say, if you believe in something, it's okay. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven. Under heaven. No other name under heaven given to men for salvation. No other name except the name of Jesus. Now, I know that we are in a day where so many things are being preached. In other words, they tell us to accept everybody uh, from the standpoint of religious tolerance. We should tolerate people of other faiths, okay? Tolerance is not the same thing as believing. We don't have to believe other faiths. Somebody said there are many ways to God. How could you say there's only one way to God? There must be many ways to God. That means God is confused. Is that what you're saying? No, he's given us so many ways. Anybody can find God. No. A thousand times, no. You say, why do you say so? I'll tell you why. Nobody, nobody, no one ever said, I am the way. Buddha said, follow me. I'm searching the way, we'll find the way together. Jesus said, I am the way. Now what if somebody else said so? Okay, move to the next one. Jesus said, I am the truth. Meaning I am the reality. No man ever said those words. You say, what if somebody else did? Well, Jesus said another one. He said, I am the life. life nobody ever said those words you say what if somebody else said it well jesus listen he was crucified he died on that cross he was buried the third day he arose nobody ever came out of the grave so he proved himself to be the son of god with power by the resurrection from the dead. Can you shout amen somebody? Amen. Nobody. He was very dead. The Bible tells us when he was hanging on that cross. A Roman soldier took a spear and thrust it through his side. Blood and water gushed out. Proving his heart had ruptured. He was very dead. They buried him in the grave. Rolled a stone. To the entrance of that cave and seal it to make sure he didn't come out. He was there three days. And then the Bible tells us he had been embalmed with grave clothes. 
All right? And they had put some of those chemicals on those clothes and wrapped him in such a way that by the third day, that thing hardened and became a cocoon. So if he hadn't died on the cross, the Roman spear should have killed him. If he didn't die with that spear, then when they put him inside that grave and that cocoon hardened around his body, he should have died. There was only one vent around his neck because his head had not been embalmed like the rest of the body. They couldn't finish it because of the Sabbath that was done in on them. So they had to leave and hoping to complete it on Sunday morning. Are you hearing me? If the man hadn't died before then, that thing should have now killed him. It hadn't around his body. Every finger was wrapped. Every toe was wrapped. Everything was wrapped except his head. He should have died. Now, tell me. Look, on Sunday, the Bible says early in the morning, before dawn, the women who had done the embalming came to complete it. They got to the grave. They noticed the stone had been rolled away. They said, what? The stone has been rolled away. And then they ran away to tell the disciples, someone has rolled away the stone. John and Peter came rushing down to the grave to find out who dared desecrate that grave. They got there. The stone had been rolled away. John looked in. He didn't enter, the Bible says. Peter entered. And then John observed something. The Bible says he saw and believed. Let me tell you what John saw. He looked at that cocoon. The man was not inside. The cloth that was covering his head was wrapped, showing he was not in a hurry to go out. It was wrapped properly folded properly and kept beside this cocoon. It was not torn up. The neck area was empty. The whole thing was empty. Where was the man? He was out. John said, I saw and believed. And then they ran away to go tell others the master has reason. The master has reason. Then came Mary. Mary was not satisfied. She looked in. She said, maybe somebody stole the body. Maybe by some means they took it out. Where in the world could he be? And then she saw someone she thought was a gardener. She said, sir. And the gardener was facing some other area. Something else. And the woman was looking around and saw this man and said, Sir, have you seen his body? He said, Mary. She recognized that voice. And ran to a Jesus master. Jesus said, No, you don't. Don't touch me. She said, because, he said, because I haven't ascended to my father. Why? I want to tell you why. He had become the Lord high priest. And when the high priest was going into the most holy place, nobody touched him. What was he going to do? He was taking his blood. He said, I have not yet ascended to my father. He was going to the presence of the father. Now, Matthew, this was not the ascension of Jesus that's recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapter number one. 
There were two ascensions. This was the first one. It was in the garden. And he said, I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to Galilee. I like this one. He said, and tell my brethren. They had moved. See, one day he said to them, um, I do not call you servants anymore. I call you friends. They had moved from servants to friends. He said, because I've shown you everything that I've received from the Father. Now, he calls them brethren. Hallelujah. They had moved from being servants to, to friends, now to brethren. He said, but go to Galilee and tell my brethren, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Oh boy. Great news. Tell the world his reason. He's come out of the grave. That speaks my salvation. Hallelujah. You know, there's so much to be said about that. But I don't want to go too far from the subject. When I get talking about this, I can spend the whole day on it. But you know, we're talking about the Lordship of Jesus. God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. He's no ordinary man. Jesus is no ordinary man. Somebody said, well, there are many religious leaders and Jesus is the best one. No. He is not the best one. He is not among them. All right? He is not one of the religious leaders. Jesus, listen and hear me good. Jesus is God. Until... Listen, it's so important. Until you come to that revelation, you really don't know who Jesus is. Jesus is God. Let me say it again. If you don't understand it, Jesus is God. So I said, but Jesus didn't say he's God. Exactly what he said. He's God. He said, but who is his father? Uh-huh. That's the mystery of godliness. <laughs> Let me read something to you. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, the Word of God has been given to us to live by. Would you turn to 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter number 3. I love the word of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If I didn't have a Bible, what would I have been thinking? Huh? Would I have been assuming everything about God? Thank God I got a Bible. Aren't you glad you have one? First Timothy chapter number 3, verse 16. I want you all to read it together. One, two, go. Now stop. Where it says great is a mystery of godliness, the word godliness there means the nature of of God. He now wants to explain something to us about God. All right? All right, read it again. Want to go and finish it. Did you see that? One more time. God was what? One more time. Now, when you are through reading this, I want you to put a name there. I want you to tell me who this could be. God? No, 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 no. You're going to finish it and make your own conclusion. Now, start again. Received up into glory. 
Tell me, who is this? Who is this? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. See, he's no religious leader. He is God. All right. Now, let's look at another thing. St. John's Gospel, chapter number one. Rush this. St. John's Gospel, chapter number one. Are you there? All right. I want you carefully to read verse one. The word was what? One more time. All right. Read verse two. Verse three. Again. Again. One more time. Finish it. Go on. Stop. He hasn't given him a name yet. He's just talking about the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was. And now notice he didn't say, and the Word is God. He said, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Then it gives us the big thing. In him was life. Dear, dear, dear Jesus. Life, Zoe. Now, the writer pauses for a moment and begins to talk about someone. Go, look at verse 6. Go on. Stop. Who is he talking about now? John. He says there was a man sent from God. Whose name was John? He tells us that John was sent to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Then he tells us clearly, John was not that light. Because John was a great man. And certain people believed in John. But he tells us through the scriptures and by the spirit that John was not that light. He was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, verse 9. Oh, hallelujah. Aye. That was what? Now, he's brought in something else. I want you to notice this. He talks about the Word. And the Word was God. Then he brings in another thing. He calls him the light. He's given him another name. The light. And we all know the word of God is light. We'll come to that shortly. And then he says, that light was the true light. Why? Because there are many lights, brothers and sisters. There are many lights. Many false lights. And they don't give you the right colors. Many false lights. So he tells us about the true light. That lights every man that comes into the world. That's the reason there is a God-shaped vacuum in every human spirit. Everyone has a knowledge inside him that there is a living God. Including the atheists. Now come on. Let's read this thing. Oh, 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 glory to God. Now, look at verse 10. Huh, read it, come on. He, come, oh, stop. The word is what? He, he. Say it with me. He. he. 
Now, he's been talking about the word, the light, which is the true light. Now, he says, he, he, he. All right, read it. Ah, uh, the world was what? We read earlier. This must be talking about the word one more time. Because without him was not anything made that was made. All right? The word. Now he says, he was in the word. And the word was made by him. And the word knew him not. Thank you, Jesus. It's an honor to know Jesus. I'm telling you. Come on. Read verse 10 into verse 11. Come on. Oh. Hmm. Twelve. Stop. Stop. This is awesome. He says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the power. Because you cannot be a child of God by yourself. Your mother cannot make you a child of God. Your dad cannot make you a child of God. Your works cannot make you a child of God. Your age cannot make you a child of God. He says here, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the authority, the ability to become, glory to God, to become, to become, to become. You remember what he said to Peter and the other disciples? He said, follow me and I will make you. I will make you fish as a man. He said, I'll make you. He has the power. He says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the ability. He gave the authority. He gave the power to become the sons of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even to them that believe on his name. Oh, great news. See why I like to preach the gospel? I feel like everybody ought to hear it. I feel like the whole world ought to know it. Yes. 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 Because only those who receive him receive the power to become. How can you receive one of whom you have never heard? And how can you hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to tell you about him. And then when you hear it, at least you have an opportunity to believe. And if you believe in his name, you receive the power to become. That's why we preach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. The 13th verse. Ah, that verse. That, that verse is everything. I'm telling you. That 13th verse is the closest that John could pick. You know this book was written long after so many things in the book of Acts. Don't think that the book of Matthew was written before Mark and then before Luke, and then before John, and, and then before Acts, and then you think that um, they were being written as the works were being done. No. John wrote this after he had known the epistles. He had read them. But the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the Holy Ghost ensured that each one stayed in the area that he wanted them to stay, not to go beyond. 
So John, in his writing, gets so close to wanting to give us something of the new contract. But then he barely gives us a glimpse into that glory and he stops. And this is that verse where he comes so close. Where he would have just let the cat out of the bag, you understand? But then he stopped. Look at it. You've got to read 12 into 13 so you understand it. One to go. To them. Oh. Which not nor nor of the will of man, but of God. He's talking about being born again. He's telling you that when you become a child of God, because it says, to those who believe in his name, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Then he says, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I could preach for the rest of the year on that. Every day, every day, I said that is everything. You know what it's telling you? That when you are born again, the life in you is not the life of blood. Now it's important for you to understand this. The Bible tells us that the blood of man is the life of his flesh. The life of your body is in your blood. Hey, come on. If you've read about that in science, it'll tell you that. The life of the human body is in the blood. That's why a baby, when a baby is born, the blood of that baby doesn't come from the mother. It comes from the father. The blood of that baby doesn't mix with the blood of the mother as long as that baby is in the womb. The life of that child is in the blood and the blood comes from the father. That's the life of your body. Now he tells us, when you become a child of God by being born again, like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away and all things are become new. And that's exactly what John is talking about. He says, which were born, not of blood. Now, Paul puts it in a better way. When he gives it to us in Romans the 8th chapter and the 11th verse. He says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he said, that same spirit shall vitalize your mortal body. That spirit shall give life to your mortal body. In other words, the life of your body is no longer by blood. When you understand this, sickness will be an old story. Listen, listen. Don't live by human experience. Live by word experience. Because God says, my people perish because they lack knowledge. He didn't say because their experiences are terrible. He said because they lack knowledge. And the Bible says, through knowledge shall the righteous be delivered into his inheritance. Your inheritance is waiting for you, but your knowledge will put you over. And if you're ignorant, you'll suffer. And nobody can help you. The life of your body, when you're born again, is no longer by blood. That's why he says, they that dwell therein, talking about the kingdom of God, talking about Zion, he says, they that dwell therein shall not say, I am sick.
Oh, what about when sickness fastens its hold on their body? What about when you discover symptoms of sickness or disease in your body? It makes no difference. I said it makes no difference. The Bible says about Abraham, the father of faith, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God against hope. He believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. That's what you call the father of faith. The fight of faith is, is, see, remember the Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith. It calls it a good fight. What what was the meaning of the fight of faith? The fight of faith is when you know in the word of God that divine health belongs to you and yet sickness comes to your body. It's a fight of faith. It's when you hold on to your faith and you say, I refuse to go down under this pressure. I refuse to submit myself to this sickness. I refuse to die. I refuse to be sick. This disease cannot stay in my body. That's the fight of faith. And when you say it, it seems like it's getting worse. It seems like the pain is getting more intense. And you say, devil, you're a liar. You can throw your best shot. I refuse to be sick. That's the fight of faith. The fight of faith is when all hell has broken loose in your office. And you say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Are you still there? We are more than conquerors. You see, John almost got right into it. Hiya. But you know, that's not where we want to stop. I want you to read verse 14. We're talking about the Word. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This Jesus. Hiya. Who is he? All right, now look at verse 14. I want you all to read it together. One, two, go. Hiya. Hey. Hey. Full of grace and truth. Look at that. He says, and the word was made flesh. The Greek rendering says, the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. He says we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. He's talking about Jesus. He says the word became flesh. The word. Which was in the beginning with God. The Bible says. He himself was God. All things were made by him. Now he says that word. Became flesh. And dwelt among us. He says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He says he was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Think about it. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the ability, the authority to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. And then, you know, John, John. He can, he can just turn this thing loose. And, and he goes again. He's trying to pick something out of it. I want you to look at that 16th verse. It's so touching. Come on, read it. And, oh, of his fullness have all we received. Of his fullness. Do you know what he's talking about? Of his fullness. Oh! Of his fullness. He says every one of us has gotten out of it. We've gotten something out of his fullness. What was his fullness? In the 26th verse of St. John's Gospel, 5th chapter, Jesus said something. I want you to turn in there and read it. I said, nobody ever talked like Jesus. Nobody talked like Jesus. I want you to read it. One, two, go. Stop, stop, stop. Let's wait for some others. Are you all there now? All right. One, two, go. All 
All right. Then you ask, why then is Jesus called the Son of God? Uh-huh. I will tell you. Are you ready? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Why is Jesus called the Son of God? If Jesus is God, why then is he called the Son of God? How many of you are asking that question? Because if you're not asking, it's no use for me to stay there. I'll just go on to something else. How many of you are asking, if Jesus is God, which you are willing to believe, why then is he called the Son of God? How many of you are asking? If there are many of you, I will, I will explain it. But if, if, if you already know, it's no use for me to talk about it. All right. If Jesus is God, why is he called the Son of God? Thank you, Lord Jesus. First, do you know what it is for someone to be called God? Let's, let's start from there. Do you know the meaning of the word God, G-O-D? Come on now, talk to me. You are here. Don't act like you're not here. You are here. I can see you. What is God? Who is God? What is God? When you say God, what are you referring to? What are those things that should characterize such deity to be called God? All right, let me give you a few things. All right? Number one. He must. Be the creator. Of all things. It's number one. Now remember, we're not talking about a God. We're talking about the God. Definite article. If he is God, meaning the God, certain things must qualify him so to be. Number one, he must be the creator of all things. Now, in that case, he will not be called the God of thunder, or the God of iron, or the God of rain, and so on and so forth. He has to be the God of everything. So he must be the creator of all things. Now, have we read that about him? Number two. He must be omnipotent. That means all powerful. In other words, he should have the ability to do all things and anything. Omnipotent. He should have all power. All power. What did Jesus say? All power. In heaven and in earth. Is given unto me. He didn't say some. He said all. Number three. He must be omniscient. Meaning all-knowing. He should know all things and everything at the same time. He shouldn't wait for any information. If he is God, he must be omniscient. Hallelujah. Are you still there? He ought to be. He should know all things. He should be the embodiment of all knowledge and all wisdom. Number four, he must be omnipresent. Meaning, he should have the ability to be everywhere at the same time. He doesn't come and go. You understand that? He should be everywhere at the same time. If he is God, he must be omnipresent. 
They must be able to find him anywhere, anytime. They must be able to call on him anytime, anywhere. He must be able to respond anytime, anywhere, the same way if he desires to. Number five. Is that number five? He must be a master communicator. In other words, he should be able to communicate with everyone, everything, anytime, anyway. Are you still there? We're talking about God. Who is God? All right, he's got to have all of these abilities. Now, something else. Why is Jesus called the Son of God? And I said, first let us, let's find out who is God. When you say God, uh, we're not talking about he's the Son of a God. He is the Son of God. So who is God? And um, we, we've tried to look at a few things. Which this, some qualities that this God must possess. Remember, we said he must be the creator. And then that means, of course, that he must be the life giver. All right? He must be the origin. You can make that the sixth one. He must be the origin of life. Meaning that he himself should be called life. All right now. So why is Jesus called the Son of God? Very simple. You've got to understand this. It's so important. See, some people don't understand these things. And that's the reason why they are confused. But why, why don't I also misunderstand it? How can I believe that Jesus is God and I also believe he's the Son of God? I call him the Son of God like you do. And yet I believe he is God. How could I believe those two things? And a, a conflict of opinions? No. A contradiction? Not at all. When you study the Bible, there's no contradiction at all. Now, here it is. You begin from Genesis to understand all great truths take their root in the book of Genesis. All kingdom revelations have their root in the book of Genesis. Now in Genesis, when you study from chapter 1, he tells us in the beginning, from verse 1, in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. And Elohim is Hebrew word for God, plural for God. In other words, if you were to read it literally in the Hebrew, it would say, Elohim, the gods, created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, the gods created the heaven and the earth. So Elohim is plural for God. But then the Hebrew always reminds people. He says, the Lord, he says, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Letting them know that even though we use the term Elohim, we are not dealing with a plurality of personalities, but one God. Because they couldn't understand. How could God be plural? Gods, and yet is one. But truly, there was a plurality of personality which will be revealed later. Are you saying this? This is what God was giving them. And so they were not confused. So they said, in the beginning, the gods created the heaven and the earth. That's the reason in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, you hear, and God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So who was us? Who was he talking to? So you can now understand why he uses the, the word Elohim in verse 1. The gods created the heaven and the earth. So in verse 26, he says, let us make man. So who's he referring to? He said, Jesus, no. That's what many Pentecostals believe. And many charismatics. Jesus wasn't there. The Bible doesn't say Jesus was there. He says, so who's Jesus then? That's what I'm trying to tell you. So just listen. Are you still here? How many of you are following what I'm saying? You're understanding, you're coming. All right, great, great. 
So, it tells us in verse 2, Genesis chapter 1, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In verse 3, he says, and God said, God said, that's the first time we find him speaking. God said. Now, in verse 2, we have a revelation of someone. He says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That is the Spirit. So you write that down, the Spirit of God. All right? We'll talk about who is that. That's the Spirit of God. You write that down. Now, he moves to verse 3 and says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So already, we know something. The Spirit of God was on earth. Papa God was not there. The earth was without form and void. Why? Was it created without form and void? Emphatically, no. It wasn't. When you read your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 4 and read from verse 24 down, he tells us about the judgment on the earth. How verse 2 came about. And then you discover why God said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say, let us make something in our image and call him man. He said, let us make man, meaning there was a man before. He said, let us make man in our image. Meaning, man was not before then in the image of God. Are you still there? Are you sure you're still there? All right. So you talk about man who was created or who, who existed millions of years ago. That story is true. That man lived millions of years ago. Oh yes, they said he had a tail. Oh yes, they said he had a long jaw. Oh yes, they said he looked beastly and ugly. Oh yes, that was man in that form. But after the destruction of the world, when it was covered with water and darkness, in verse 2, the Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon it, upon the earth. Man had been judged. The whole world had been destroyed. That man was not made in the image of God. That's the one that science has discovered some of his bones. Why? Because, you see, the account of creation in the book of Genesis is not the account of original creation. It is the account of a recreation. Are you still here? Now, what I'm preaching to you now, I already preached it in a series of teachings in 1990. So some of you ought to have the tapes. I gave you this in a series of teachings in 1990. That's how many years ago? What? 14 years ago. All right. So I'm not telling you something that's new. It's been there all the time. 14 years ago, you had the tapes. Of course, most of you were not here then. You are... Freshman. Hallelujah. See, when you understand the Bible, you don't have problems with science. You don't have problems with, you know, the discoveries and so on and so forth. It's people who are ignorant. Some are even trying to support God. And they say, no, 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 no. Uh, man is only 6,000 years old. No. Man in the image of God is almost 6,000 years old. But not man in his original creation. And the earth is more than 6,000 years old. So the account in Genesis is a, an account of recreation, not of creation. You say, how do you know? It's all in the Bible. All right, number one. You notice when God said, let there be light, and then he separated the light from the darkness and so on and so forth, and then the, the various birds and animals, you know, the mammals, the reptiles and so on, they, they, they lived in the being. Then he said something in the 28th verse of chapter 1. Talking about man, after he had made man in his image and in his likeness. He says, God gave them dominion. And God said, replenish the earth. 
Now that's a key word right there. You don't replenish something that was not there before. As far as God said replenish the earth, God meant that the earth was in good shape before and became bad. And now he's given man the responsibility to set it in order again. So it proves that that creation was a recreation. And man was now given his part of the job to replenish the earth. That means recultivate it. Begin to put it in order again. Set the whole thing straight. That's what God told him. That's why he used the word replenish the earth. Hallelujah. Are you still there? All right. Now, 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 now. In verse 3, chapter 1, Genesis, I said, God said. In verse 26, he said, let us. Already we found someone in verse 2. He's called the Spirit of God. And he was moving upon the face of the waters. And then God said. And when you study later in the Bible, you find that it was the Spirit of God that caused this creation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, who is the Spirit of God? Hmm. Because until you understand the Spirit of God, you cannot understand Jesus. Who is the Spirit of God? I've told you before. I've told you. I've told you. I know that I've told you. Who is the Spirit? Dun, 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 dun. The Bible says to make melody in your heart to the Lord. That's exactly what I'm doing. See, the Word of God, you practice the Word of God. You understand? You don't just read it. He says, make melody in your heart to the Lord. So what do you do? See, when you're cool, when you're happy, when you're full of joy, when you're full of the Spirit, that'll happen. But when your life is roasted, <laughs> I mean, you're in bad shape. You can't sing songs. Hallelujah. But you ought to know this. Don't live according to life's experiences. Live above them. And before long, you will dominate them. Hallelujah. Are you still here? All right, I said, who is the Spirit of God? Who is He? When we say Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, we're talking about the same thing, all right? It's the same thing. We're referring to the same person. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. King James calls Him Holy Ghost. <laughs> Newer versions say Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of God. But who is He? Jesus defined Him. St. John's Gospel, chapter number 15. This Holy Spirit, this precious, wonderful, Holy Spirit of God, do you love Him? Let me tell you about Him. Hallelujah, 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 glory, glory, glory. Uh, oh, oh, hmm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. From chapter 15 in John's Gospel, I'm reading to you from verse 26. All right, verse 26. Are you ready? But when the Comforter, the Greek used the word parakleton, that means one called to go together with you. Called to go together with you. In other words, he's walking alongside. He's going together with you. He says, when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even... The spirit of truth. Ah, have you noticed that now? What is he called? One more time. Hmm. 
Thank you, Holy Ghost. So mercy, thank you, Holy Ghost. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth. Now, the word truth is referring to reality. So you say, the Spirit of reality. Oh, thank you, Lord. So he says, but when the Comforter... Now, you remember what Jesus said, I'll pray the Father and he shall send you another comforter. All right, you remember that? What was he talking about? He says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. The Greek called him, Alos Parakletos. What does that mean? When Jesus said, another comforter. He says, Alos Parakletos. Alos is Greek for another and then paracletus one call to go with you together with you why did Jesus use alos because he ought to have said heteros paracletus meaning another one it would be another so they, they used two words for another one was heteron or alon or you say, Alos or Heteros. Heteros Paracletos. Meaning another comforter. Now, comforter was one of the several Greek synonyms. Praise God. Why did Jesus choose the word Alos instead of Heteros? Heteros was used if it was another of a different kind. But he used alos if it was another of exactly the same kind. So Jesus didn't say, I'll pray the Father and he shall send you heteros paracletos, which would have meant another of a different kind in quality. But he says, I'll pray the Father and he shall send you Alos Paracletos, meaning another one that is exactly like me. He looks like me. He talks like me. He acts like me. He loves like me. In other words, you will not miss Jesus when he goes. Because the Holy Ghost will come and take his place. And the Holy Ghost will relate to you as lovingly as Jesus did. And the disciples were comforted. Hallelujah. I believe that's one of the reasons they chose the word comforter among the several synonyms. For paracletos. Alright, now there's a reason we said that. Let's go to our verse, verse 26, St. John's Gospel, chapter number 15. But when the paracletos, one that's called to go together with you, is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, who is he? Even the Spirit of truth. Now, he tells us who he is. Which proceeded. I want you to underline that word. I want you to notice. Jesus should have said. Which will proceed from the father. He didn't say that. You know Jesus always chose his words carefully. For example when, when they asked him about Abraham. And uh, when he said. Uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they began to laugh at him. They said, we, 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 we said it, you're crazy, you're mad. You're not up to 50 years and have you seen Abraham? Then Jesus, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now grammatically, he should have said, before Abraham was, I was. Now that would have meant that he was before Abraham. But he didn't say that. They expected him to go into a discussion of semantics. But he didn't. He said, before Abraham was, I am. You know what he did? He chose the very word that God Almighty chose when Moses asked him in the burning bush and he said, who shall I say sent me? He said, tell them, I am has sent you. He said,
said, that is my name. My name is I am. So Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. That's the reason they picked up stones to kill him. If he had said, before Abraham was, I was. They would say, look, 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 look at you. We know your mother, we know your father. But he said, before Abraham was, I am. They said, you are making yourself equal with God. He chose his words carefully. Now again, he says, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. He gives us a light as to who the Holy Ghost is. The Holy Ghost is the one that proceeds from the Father. What is Jesus talking about? What is Jesus saying? No wonder. He's so awesome. God Almighty is so wonderful. There's no way for us to describe him. He's so great. Great, great, great. Let me explain what Jesus is communicating to his disciples. Come here, come. Let me show you something. I've tried to explain this to you several times. I pray to God that for once you'll catch it. Bring that chair. I want to show you something. Oh boy. Man, oh man. Oh boy. Sit down. Now watch this. Let's assume this is Papa God on the throne. Smile, Jesus loves you. Now let's take it that this is Papa God on the throne. He sits on the throne. He doesn't need to get up from the throne. He doesn't get tired. He cannot be tired of sitting. He is not man. He cannot be weary of anything. He never gets bored. It's no use getting up. He sits on the throne. He is the ancient of days. Around him are wonderful angels of God. The Bible says all the time they keep saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. Somebody said the thrice holy God. Well, they go, holy, holy, holy. All the time. They look at him and go, holy, holy, holy. Why do they do that? I want to tell you why they do that all the time. Because every time, as they turn to look at God, his glory has changed. He's not what they saw before. So they go, holy, holy, holy. By the time they lift their heads up, his glory has changed. They see another side of God. They say his many-sided wisdom. They talk about his many-sided form. So they go, holy, holy, holy. They raise their heads one more time. The glory has changed. Always the angels wonder at the awesomeness of this great God of glory. They are never bored of worshipping him. Somebody said, we'll be bored in heaven. You will not be bored, brother. Every time you raise your head, you see something else. Every time you lift your eyes, you see another glory. That's why you see, as we know, we learn about God and press into Him to learn more about Him. All the time, we are enthused by His presence. We are inspired by His glory. And as we raise our eyes again, there He is with another glory. Hallelujah! Oh, glory! I lift my eyes and I see He's the blesser of Abraham. Glory to God! Oh, and I say, holy, holy, holy. Then I lift my eyes. I see he's the healer. Oh, holy, holy, holy. Great, great glory. And while he's sitting on the throne, he wants to do something over there. Do you know
know what? He just pops out from here. Then they see him. He's going over there. But he's sitting over there. And the angels cry, look at him. Holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah. And he's walking down this way. And while he's doing something over here, he's still here. He's still here. Then he wants to do something over there. While he's doing it over there, he pops out this way. He's over here. Guess what? Why he's here? He wants to move over there. He's still fixing this stuff. He pops out from here to there. He's here. He's there. He's still on the throne. He's right over there. Go with a God. Woo! That's why while he was on the on the throne in heaven. Jesus was being baptized by John. And the Holy Ghost just... <laughs> remember, at this time, remember, at this time, John the Baptist, John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost was in John the Baptist. Yet the Holy Ghost came out of heaven in the form of a dove and came upon Jesus. Are you still there? Who is the Holy Ghost? That which proceeds from the Father. Hallelujah. He carries the divine presence. And while he is doing all that, one day, one day, one day, a little boy named Chris wanted to receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost came right into my spirit. Oh, glory to God. Glory. Now, he lives in me. As though he weren't anywhere else. And he lives right inside you. And he lives in you. And he lives in you. He lives in you. Glory to God. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Who is the Holy Ghost? He is the communicator of the divine presence. Who is the Holy Ghost? He is the distributor of the blessings of God. Who is the Holy Ghost? Wow. Let me tell you something. Are you still here? That Holy Spirit... He's the one that we ought to get acquainted with. If you know him, he will reveal the Father to you. If you know him, he'll reveal Jesus to you. If you know him, he will fill your life with the goodness of God. If you know him, brother, if you know him, oh, your troubles, oh, your trials, hallelujah, they will bow before you. If you know the Holy Ghost. He says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ha. Glory to Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. You know, I'm out of time. But we'll continue next week. We're talking about the Lordship of Christ. The Lordship of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? I said he is God. Who is the Holy Ghost? Brother, the Holy Ghost is God. Can you shout amen, somebody? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Rabbi Shandalamaya. Speak in other tongues. Worship him and glorify God. Glorify God. Glorify God. Glorify God. 
He says, this is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory. Open your mouth and speak in other tongues. There's power in your mouth. There's fire in your tongue. Begin to speak blessings. Begin to prophesy. Speak about your future now. Speak the blessings of God upon your life. That is in the world. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors. There's no disadvantage to the child of God. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them. Who are the called according to his purpose? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you to listen for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. 
Your Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's a message in other tongues. Someone's got interpretation. Or you are all just waiting. Or are you just waiting for her to finish? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Have you not known? Have you not known I have put myself on the inside of you? You are my express image. You have been created to express my person on the face of earth. Just take the step. Wherever you go, you express myself. Men will continually see you and see me manifest in you. You are my creation. You are my express image. I have created you, hallelujah, to manifest my life onto the world. Matiba shekele baria basi kele bonto koko shikia. Brekele basa takabaya kile boshe kele boso koko tikia. I have made myself perfect on the inside of you. Take a walk manifest my nature and my character in the world let the world know that in you i live that in you i dwell whatever you do is me i have put my words in your mouth speak it i have put my message in your mouth declare it men will hear you and they will believe the word that you speak hallelujah Malika Boshke le brosi kabahaya hasike le boto kosike. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now be calm. Some of you were shouting at the wrong time. And now you miss the word, the prophetic utterance that was being given while you were shouting. How many of you heard, heard the word? Some of you close to loudspeakers would have heard. Okay, many of you did. You heard the word? All right, but some others were shouting so much they couldn't hear nothing. The next time when, when a word... You see, I, I used the microphone to let you know someone speaking, let us listen. By helping that person have a, a higher volume than others. So others should have waited, because that's what the Bible says. See, even if we're all going to prophesy in this place, you have to wait for someone to be through before you start. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.